The author of Joshua wants us to be very clear about the theme of chapter 7. He uses a literary technique that's called an inclusio in which the author begins and ends with the same point and everything in between relates back to that one main point. That main point is introduced to us in verse 1. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. He then concludes with the same theme in verse 26. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. And everything in between verse 1 and verse 26 is the account of how God's wrath came upon the people of Israel and how it was finally averted. This is a startling chapter in the continuing narrative of Joshua because everything so far has been overwhelmingly positive. This new generation of Israelites have proven themselves radically different than the previous generation. The wrath of God was frequently upon that generation, but this generation has been more or less faithful from the very first, or so we thought. It turns out that there was sin lurking beneath the surface of Joshua chapter 6. No one would ever have known it was the kind of sin that one can keep hidden, that one can keep secret, but God knew. God always knows. And God brought it to light. And how Israel dealt with that sin once it was brought to light would determine the future of the nation. Joshua 7 is a picture of church discipline. Now, not everything is the same. Israel was a theocracy. It was a nation as well as a church. And therefore, it bore the power of the sword to inflict capital punishment upon wrongdoers. The church today possesses no such power. At least it ought not anywhere. We do not put people to death for sin, but the principle remains the same. Sin can no more be ignored in the new covenant church than it could in old covenant Israel. Once it is brought to light, it must be dealt with. Otherwise, the wrath of God abides upon the church just as surely as it abided upon Israel. God removes his spirit from churches that will not deal with sin. He removes the presence of his glory. He, in the words of Revelation, he takes away his lampstand. Judgment falls and the church is given over to its enemies. Now I know that this concept is new to some of you. You came in today and you thought you knew what it meant that God is so good, he's so good to me, you imagine that with the coming of the New Testament also came a kinder, gent- a kinder, gentler God. That's not true. We err when we think of God as either less willing to forgive in the old covenant or more tolerant of sin in the new covenant. God is just as opposed to sin. He is just as committed to the holiness of his people today in the new covenant as he was in the old covenant. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit concerning the sale price of their property in Acts chapter 5, God struck them dead. When the man in Corinth was engaged in sexual immorality with his stepmother, apparently with the church's knowledge and implicit blessing, God chastised the church and commanded them to cast out the wicked man, namely to deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh in order that his spirit might be saved in the day of judgment. Paul commanded the church at Thessalonica to disfellowship from the brother who refused to work, who refused to hold down a job, but instead lived in idleness. He commanded Titus to put the divisive man out of the church after a first or second warning. Jesus himself, in his letters to the churches in Revelation, threatens judgment upon the church at Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and Laodicea, and some of the individuals in those churches he threatens with death. So this is not merely an Old Testament thing. The account of Achan's sin and of Israel's response 
is a picture of how sin is to be handled within the congregation of God's people. So I invite you to follow along this morning as we walk through the seven stages of God's wrath upon Israel in Joshua chapter 7. And as we do, I want you to be asking yourself three questions. Number one, am I willing to see this as a just and necessary response to grievous sin within the church? Or, whether I will admit it or not, do I actually see this as something of an overreaction on God's part? Ask yourself that. Number two, would I be willing to carry out the Lord's judgment upon Achan if I had lived in Israel's day? Am I willing to do what is necessary to deal with sin if and when it arises within this church? And number three, Do I have hidden sin that needs to be brought forth, confessed, and cleansed before the Lord himself reveals it? What forbidden sin do I have hidden within my tent, out of the sight of all others except God? I'm praying that God would do a powerful work in our midst this morning, that he would make us appalled at the enormity of of sin and willing to do whatever it takes in order that our heart and our church might be clean and faithful in his sight. And I pray that he would enable us to find that gracious balance between the reverent fear of God's wrath on the one hand and the confident rest in God's mercy on the other. So number one, I want you to see the cause of of God's wrath upon Israel. Now it's important to note that this is information that the author is giving to us, the reader. Neither Joshua nor the people of Israel have access to this knowledge at this point in the chapter. They will find out in due time. But we begin with verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard, in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. There's the sin. The the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Now we talked back in Joshua chapter 6 about this concept of something being devoted to destruction. Harem in the Hebrew. The Lord had placed a curse If you'll remember, upon all living things, man and beast, in Jericho, and he had laid claim to the material spoil for himself. All of the silver and all of the gold was to be taken into the treasury of the Lord. Everything else was to be killed and burned. Joshua 6, 17, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all the silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of of the Lord. So all living things in Jericho were to be put to the sword and the flame, and all material wealth went into the Lord's treasury. At least that was the command. The Lord wanted no remnant of this land's pagan past to remain and so defile the people of Israel and tempt them to sin. And all of Israel obeyed God's command except one man. Achan, we come to find out, was charmed by the allure of a Babylonian cloak, literally a beautiful cloak from Shinar, as well as silver and gold. Achan was consumed by greed and he coveted these items. So he took them and he hid them in his tent. And this provoked the burning anger of the Lord that is described for us in verse 1. Now, as I said earlier, the temptation here for us is to see this as an overreaction on God's part. I mean, it's it's just a cloak. About five pounds of silver, 200 shekels, and a small gold bar weighing maybe a pound and a quarter. 
I mean, it's not insignificant, but it, it's, it's not a vast treasure by any means. And it's certainly not worth the lives of 36 Israelite soldiers, Achan's household, and of Achan himself, right? Well, let me read you an incisive comment from Dale Davis, a great commentator on the book of Joshua. He says, the severity of the judgment is an index to the enormity of the sin. In other words, what God does with the sin is a better index of, of its enormity than the way that we think about it. Our problem here is, he says, sinners that we are, we don't think breaking Yahweh's covenant is all that big a deal. Test yourself in this. We really cannot understand God's wrath because sin does not bother us much. That's why we are mystified when we read passages like Exodus 32, the golden calf at Sinai, or Numbers 25, the, the Baal worship at Peor. That's why we cannot understand Jesus when he tells us that we should be willing to go to any extreme, cutting off the hand, the foot, gouging out the eye, in order to avoid sin. It's baffling to us, Davis says, because we don't share Jesus' alarm over sin. But we need to bear in mind that it's not about what was taken. I mean, what need has God of a cloak? What does he care about silver and gold? The problem was the heart that lay underneath Achan's sin and underneath the sin of the people of Israel. The people of Israel broke faith. Literally, in the Hebrew text, it says they treasonously committed treason. Achan coveted these items. So it was unbelief, it was faithlessness to the covenant and it was idolatry. I'll remind you that Paul says in Colossians 3, 5 that covetousness is idolatry. It's raising something else as of more value than the Lord God and of faithfulness to him. So unbelief, faithlessness to the covenant, and idolatry lay at the heart of Achan's sin. And if you've read through Scripture at all, you know that God takes those two sins in particular very, very seriously. So if your response to this story is that God flew off the handle and he overreacted, let me suggest that this says far more about you than it does about God. Achan was not innocent. His guilt was not small. His actions revealed what was in his heart. That he took these goods against the expressed command of God reveals that he considered the Lord of less value than a cloak and a few pounds of metal. The fact that he hid them in his tent and tried to conceal them shows that he thought so little of God's omniscience that he imagined that these items could be hidden from the eyes of God just as easily as they could be hidden from the eyes of his countrymen. This was not a minor sin. The author of Hebrews or the author of Joshua calls this treasonous treason. They broke faith. And the burning anger of the Lord was more than justified. Number two, I want you to see the consequence of God's wrath upon Israel. What happens when God's wrath breaks forth against his people? Well, sometimes, as we see even in the New Testament, people die. Verse 2, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up from there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Chances are, if you've ever heard a sermon on Joshua chapter 7, the preacher used this episode as an example either of the results of prayerlessness or of the effects of pride. Uh, 
The sermon goes like this. Joshua should have prayed, and he should have sought the Lord's counsel about what to do next, but instead he just charged right ahead, riding the high from the previous victory at Jericho. And we often do the same thing, and we shouldn't do stuff like that. And the spies should not have been overconfident about their military prowess such that they underestimated the strength of their adversaries. If they had exercised a modicum of humility, they they would not have been defeated. Well, listen to me. Prayerlessness and pride are destructive sins to be sure, but it's not the point of this passage. The author blames neither the prayerlessness of Joshua nor the pride of the Israelite spies for the defeat of Israel at Ai. He blames the wrath of God which was upon Israel because of Achan's sin. Remember, everything between verse 1 and verse 26 is related to that problem of God's wrath. If Joshua and the people of Israel were prayerless and prideful, and I think they were, it was because God provoked them to be so because they were under his wrath. I agree with another commentator, David Howard, on this passage who writes that the reason for the Israelites' defeat was that they had sinned, not that they took an inadequately sized army. So even if they had taken a larger force, the text's implication is that they too would have been defeated. And I think there's two implications of this truth for the church. The first is that when the anger of the Lord burns against the church because of the church's sin, it may result in God allowing the church to do dumb stuff. What I mean is that one of the consequences of the Lord's anger is that he he permits his people to act in foolishness. To, to venture off into destructive sin. He takes away the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Whence came this overconfidence of the Israelites? Whence came this prayerlessness, if indeed that was a factor in Joshua's ill-fated decision to send only 3,000 troops to conquer Ai? Evidently, I would suggest, the Lord had removed his hand and his spirit from Joshua and from the people of Israel and allowed them to follow the paths of their own wisdom to their own destruction. Second, When the anger of the Lord burns against a church, it may be that he brings down judgment in the form of sickness and death. This happened repeatedly in Israel's history, and it happened in the New Testament church. What happened when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit about the price of the property that they had sold? God struck them dead. What happened to the church at Corinth when certain members failed to treat the Lord's Supper with reverence, but rather were using it as an occasion for drunkenness and division? God struck them dead. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.30, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. If you had judged yourselves truly, you would not be judged. What happened when some of the church in Pergamum were committing idolatry and immorality? Jesus threatened them, saying in Revelation 2.16, Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you soon and make war with you with the sword of my mouth. We do not want Jesus coming and making war with this church. And what of the false teacher? Jesus calls her Jezebel, who's leading the church at Thyatira to commit idolatry and immorality. Jesus says, behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. New Testament. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the mind and the heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. You have got to plead with God that he would cause you to tremble before his wrath. Because it is real, and it is terrible, and it is deserved. Do not dare to allow your heart to think that God overreacted to Achan's sin. Don't allow yourself to think, well, Achan's transgression was not that bad. After all, I've done worse. Well, yes, you have, and here's what that should lead you to think. It's only by God's mercy that I'm not dead in my transgressions as well. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God, says the New Testament author of Hebrews. Hebrews. 
that you are alive and here to listen to this sermon is an astounding act of God's fathomless mercy and patience towards you. That God does not treat every act of idolatry and unbelief with the same degree of severity is astounding. Don't look at Joshua chapter 7 and say, man, God overreacted. Think, God forbid that I would spurn this day of grace and repent that you may be saved. Third, we come to the complaint against God's wrath. Now, obviously, in the aftermath of the conquest of Jericho, the defeat at Ai caused a great deal of consternation in Israel and provoked this passionate prayer from Joshua, verse 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say? When Israel has turned their backs before their enemies. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So the defeat at Ai had caused something of a crisis for Israel. For one thing, Joshua feared that their, their psychological advantage over the peoples of Canaan had been lost. You remember what Rahab had told the Israelite spies back in Joshua chapter 2? She said, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen on us. And all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. All of the people are melting with fear before the armies of Israel and before their God. There is no spirit left in any man, she says, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. Well, the fears of the Canaanites then only intensified in the aftermath of the fall of Jericho, but now it, it appears that the Lord has forsaken Israel because they were chased from Ai like rabbits. The author even uses the same language now to describe the fear of the Israelites. Instead of the hearts of the peoples of Canaan melting, now the hearts of the people melted and became as water. So Joshua is afraid that the mystique that surrounded Israel in the eyes of the Canaanites had been lost, and he fears that the defeat of Ai will embolden the Canaanites to band together and so to destroy them. But more importantly, Joshua and the people of Israel must have wondered what this defeat meant for the covenant that God had made with them. Were they still the people of God? Why had God apparently broken covenant and forsaken them? So Joshua argues in his prayer on the basis of the fame of God's name, which God had placed upon this covenant with Israel. In other words, Joshua reminds the Lord, as though he needed it, that he could not forsake his people Israel, not without bringing dishonor upon his own name. And I want to suggest to you, that's a fabulous way to pray. When you find yourself in Joshua's position, unable to understand why disaster has struck Argue with God on the basis of his sure and certain covenant and the fame of God's name. Not that God needs the reminder to be faithful to his covenant, but you need it. You need to know that even though you cannot understand what God is doing in his discipline of his people at the moment, he will not break his covenant. He will not dishonor his name, which he has set upon his people. Again, Davis writes, there are times when the people of God today stand in solidarity with Joshua's Israel. That is, there are periods in which confusion strikes and we haven't any idea what God is about. We have no recourse but Joshua's, that is, anguished prayer to a mystifying God, pleading both our danger and his honor. There are times, I love that phrase, when all you have is anguished prayer to a mystifying God, and that's enough. The takeaway of this for the church and for the Christian is that when disaster strikes, you can't comprehend what God is doing or where he has gone 
What do you do with that confusion? You take it to God. And you argue on the basis of God's covenant and on the basis of the fame and glory of God's name. God always has a purpose in the suffering of his people. It may be that in your suffering, he is revealing sin to you that you may repent and be healed. It may be that he is doing something else and your present suffering has nothing whatsoever to do with sin. Either way, how you should respond to the discipline of the Lord is to take your confusion, to take your complaint to God in prayer. It's not faithless to do so, to say, what are you doing? What will you do for your great name if I am forsaken? It's not faithless to pray like that. In fact, it is the response of faith. Number four, I want you to see the corporate nature of God's wrath. The Lord responds to Joshua's prayer, and his response reveals much about the corporate nature of God's wrath. In our individualistic, Americanized society, we tend to think of sin and of guilt as strictly individual realities, and therefore we tend to think that God directs his wrath only at individuals. That does not square with the biblical testimony. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up, why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up. Consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans, and the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household that the Lord takes shall come near by man, by or Come near man by man, and he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. I want you to notice in those six verses the way the author, verse 1, and the Lord, verses 10 through 15, both speak of Achan's sin in corporate terms. The people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things, for Achan took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Verse 1. Achan sinned, and the Lord burned with anger against all of Israel. Achan's sin was Israel's sin. The Lord tells Joshua, Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies because they have taken the devoted things for destruction. All of Israel shared in the guilt of this sin, though it was only one man who was responsible. Not only then was the sin and the guilt shared corporately by the whole of Israel, but so were the consequences of the sin. God did not snipe down Achan in the midst of the congregation of Israel and spare the rest of the nation. Thirty-six men died as a result of the failed assault on Ai. Thirty-six families lost husbands, fathers, and sons. The Lord threatened to remove his presence, not just from Achan's tent, but from the whole nation, unless they de destroyed the devoted things among them. Moreover, when Achan's sin was finally revealed and confessed, it was not Achan alone who was put to death. His whole family and all of his livestock and all that he owned was burned with fire. Now, I know this is startling. It's disturbing. It challenges our sense of justice. But again, I would remind you that my job is not to justify God in your eyes. 
My job is to teach you what God is like and to do my best to make sense of what he has revealed. And in the clearest revelation of God's character and nature to be found anywhere in the Old Testament, God highlights the corporate nature of guilt. Exodus 34, when the Lord appeared to Moses up on the top of Sinai, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, that is Moses there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Those are strong words. Now, I don't fully comprehend how the Lord's mercy and grace, his patience, his abundant and steadfast love and faithfulness mingles with his infallible commitment to justice and the intergenerational corporate punishment of sin that are described in those verses. I can't fully comprehend how this truth of the corporate nature of sin jives with other statements in Scripture regarding individual accountability, Deuteronomy 24, 16, uh, Ezekiel 18. But I know this, though I can't comprehend it, the resolution is to be found in Christ. Ask yourself this question, did not God visit the iniquity of Adam upon all of his children? And before we complain that that, that's unfair, I wasn't in the garden, I didn't eat from the forbidden fruit, consider, have not the children of Adam merited that guilt a hundred times over? Remember that the children upon whom the Lord visits the iniquity of the fathers are not innocent victims. But consider further, does not God also visit the righteousness of Christ upon all those who are born in him? Corporate, that is covenantal solidarity, goes both ways. Paul describes it in Romans 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So I would suggest that rather than questioning the justice of God in Joshua chapter 7 in holding the many accountable for the sins of the one, I would suggest that we rather accept that this is who God is. God deals covenantally, corporately with humanity. And I would suggest that we ought to rejoice that he does so because the same corporate solidarity that condemned all of us for the sin of Adam and condemned all of Israel for the sin of Achan is the very same solidarity that applies the righteousness and grace of Christ to we who have not earned it. So don't allow yourself to be drawn into our individualistic thoughts that question the justice of God in treating all Israel according to Achan's sin. Rather rejoice that God treats all believers according to Christ's righteousness. And let this truth cause you to take sin very seriously. Not only in your own heart, but in your own family and within your own church. Sin does not affect only one person. Sin affects us all. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Number five, while God's wrath has a corporate covenantal component, and while the consequences of that sin often extend to the whole community, God does not destroy the whole nation for the sin of the one not if the community will deal with the sin as he commands. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near, tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Can you just imagine being Achan in that moment? 
the conviction and the fear arising within Achan's soul is first his tribe is selected, then his clan is selected, then his family is selected, and then finally the lot falls to him. Achan had imagined that he could hide his sin from everyone, even God. But now that truth is coming home to his heart like a thunderbolt. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Beloved, you are no more able to hide your sin from God than Achan was. He sees, he knows, and sooner or later he will bring it forth. Do not imagine that just because as of this moment your sin has not found you out, that that means you're getting away with it. You're not. There is no getting away with sin. For God deals with sin in one of three ways. Either his kind and gentle conviction will lead you to repentance. Or his severe discipline will lead you to repentance. That's what's going on in Achan's example. Or God will let you have your sin and he will hold you to account in the final judgment when the opportunity to repent is past and all that awaits you is the sentence of everlasting hell. You don't want the third option. Do you hear me? You don't want to get away with it. And you can avoid the second option by getting ahead of the Lord's discipline and confessing and forsake it now. But do not ever imagine that your sins are hidden from God's sight or that you will get away with it forever. They aren't and you won't. Sixth, the confession that removes God's wrath. God's dealings with Achan fall into that second category. This is the Lord's severe discipline. But I believe that it's for Achan's everlasting good that he might share in God's holiness. Because this discipline of the Lord led to his confession of sin, which turned away God's wrath from the nation, and I'm going to argue, turned it away from Achan himself. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing fifty shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. It doesn't seem coincidental, by the way, that the three verbs that Achan uses to describe his sin are the very same verbs used to describe Eve's sin in the garden. Did you catch that? Achan, I saw, I coveted, so I took. Eve, chapter 3 and verse 5, Genesis, she saw, she coveted, she took. See, just as Eve's sin was not merely about eating an apple, but about desiring to be her own God, so Achan's sin was not about a cloak and some silver and gold. It was an act of idolatry and unbelief. It was a vile sin, just as wicked as Adam's and Eve's. But there is grace for Achan, just like there was grace for Adam, even in Joshua chapter 7. I don't know any other words or any other way to take Joshua's words. My son, give glory to the God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. And when Achan confesses his sin, you'll notice he confesses it as a sin against the Lord God of Israel. I think... Now, I'm not reading too much into this text to see this as a confession born of faith and heartfelt repentance. There's no equivocating. There's no blame shifting, not even like Adam and Eve did. There's no gaslighting. There's, no, there's not even a plea to be removed from the consequences of sin. This is a sincere confession of sin, which is the only kind of confession that glorifies and praises God. And a sincere confession of sin born of heartfelt heartfelt repentance and grief is always met with infinite mercy. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think that's essentially what Joshua was saying to Achan. Now, Achan had to die for his sin. More on that in a moment. 
But I think that when his eyes closed in death as the stones rained down upon him, that he was received into the waiting arms of the happy God of Israel. Finally, we read the rest of the story, which recounts the chastening rod of God's wrath. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord, and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. So the question is raised legitimately. Why did Achan still have to die if he confessed his sin and indeed, as you say, was forgiven? Why was this severe penalty still carried out? Why did his family have to perish with him? And why was all that he had destroyed and burned? Those questions are huge. They're emotionally difficult. And I don't have all the answers, but here goes. The best answer I can give you as to why Achan was still put to death after having made his confession, and I believe after having received forgiveness from the hand of God was that God made Achan an object lesson for the people of Israel of his high standards of holiness and of the dreadful consequences of violating his commands. Life and death don't belong to you. They're not yours. They are the sovereign prerogative of God alone, and he will use them as he sees fit for the good of his people and the glory of his name. And it was for the good of Israel and for our good today, to see what the end of sin is. Just examine the wickedness of your own heart, my own heart. Would Joshua 7 have the same punch if, if the penalty had been withdrawn? You know it wouldn't have. Your heart would take that and it would say, see, if you just confess your sin, you can get away with it. So God didn't do that. No, this is what the end of sin is, and he showed it to Israel and to us. God determined in his own wisdom that this was not the time for tolerance, and I would suggest that we not question that wisdom. Now, as to why his family was killed alongside him, I simply don't have an answer that will satisfy. Some have suggested that his family uh, would have been in on the sin. So they say it would have been impossible for Achan to have hidden all this stuff underneath his own tent uh, without their knowledge and consent. But, but I would suggest that this is just another example of the covenantal corporate solidarity with which God treats his people. And of course, this is not the only time in Scripture that we run into this emotional difficulty. It arises in the flood. Why the children? In the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the conquest of Canaan. Again, I would just suggest it's best not to question God's wisdom and justice and the goodness of his ways. As to why all of Achan's livestock and possessions were destroyed, I think the answer lies in that concept of devoted to destruction. You remember, God had devoted everything in Jericho to destruction. Achan took some of those things that were devoted to destruction. Therefore, God devoted Achan to destruction, along with all that he owned and all that he had taken. In other words, when Achan acted like the people of Canaan in idolatry and unbelief, then God treated him like the people of Canaan, and he came underneath the same curse as the people of Canaan. He, his household, and all that he possessed had to be destroyed. Now, the last point to be noted is that when Israel dealt with Achan's sin in obedience to the Lord's command, rather than sweeping it under the carpet or failing to act in some misplaced sense of tolerance, then the burning anger of the Lord was turned away. 
And I don't hesitate to say that the same holds true for the New Testament church. If a church fails to deal with sin according to the clear and repeated dictates of Scripture, this sort of thing is commanded in Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3, Titus 3, and in Revelation 2 and 3, If a church fails to deal with sin according to the clear commands of Scripture, then that church has likewise broken faith with God and failed to treat Him as holy, and the burning anger of the Lord is upon them. But if a church will deal with sin biblically, then the Lord turns away His burning anger and instead turns His face towards it in blessing, just as He did with Israel at the end of this chapter. Now, I've been making application all the way through this morning's sermon, but let me Let me close by summarizing three points to take away. Point number one, sin is corporate and contagious. It is destructive to the body of Christ. It is not a purely individual matter. It is a church matter. Number two, churches then must deal biblically with sin. Church discipline in the New Covenant admittedly looks different than what we've observed in Joshua 7. We're not stoning anybody here. We don't execute capital punishment for sin. The opportunity for repentance and restoration always exists until that person is dead. But many of the principles transfer from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Sin must be dealt with by the church in the biblically prescribed manner. So First Baptist Nixa... We must be committed to the biblical practice of church discipline. And as covenant members, you are as obligated to participate in that practice as were the members of the congregation of Israel in Joshua chapter 7. Finally, even though we have witnessed severe judgment and punishment in this chapter, we have also seen a severe grace. I want you to consider the alternative. God could have allowed Achan to imagine that he had gotten away with his sin. In that case, Achan would have gained a cloak, he would have gained some silver and gold, and he would have lost his soul. God saved Achan through discipline. And God saved the people of Israel from this contagious, cancerous effects of sin. God is not a monster. He's not capricious. He is good and he is holy, even in his mercy. It's better to be chastised by the merciful hand of the Lord in order that we may share in his holiness.